Hi, this is Matt Skinner with a special announcement. Our Working Preacher Spring Campaign is in full swing, and we are so grateful for each and every one of you who has given so generously already. Working Preacher relies on donors like you to provide new content every week. We also have a surprise for you. If you make a gift to the Working Preacher Spring Campaign, you will receive access to additional Working Preacher content from the Festival of Homiletics. Be sure to make your gift before May 31st to unlock your special content and help continue this important resource for preachers around the globe. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. The text for the fifth Sunday of Easter, which falls on May 15, 2022, are Acts chapter 11, 1 through 18. The psalm is Psalm 148, Revelation 21, 1 through 6, and then John 13, 31 to 35. Those are the texts. Thus endeth the reading. There's Listen no to- like alternate <laughs> verses or anything like that. Just four. No, that was back. easy. That went really fast, actually. Uh, it's great. Yeah, I, 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 I know I, with that anymore. I had to pause and look like, did I miss something? But that's it. So shall we start with John? Sure. All right. So one thing that I wanted to note on the front end is to point people to the commentary. It's a rerun, but it's a really helpful commentary uh, by Elizabeth Johnson, particularly uh, locating this passage back in its context, which is, of course, the uh, farewell discourse. But not only the not only the the context back in the farewell discourse, but uh, particularly the the way in which she uh, points out, and I've talked about this before, that the love commandment is surrounded by betrayal and denial, which you don't hear when we have this passage previously in electionary, which is Monday, Thursday. So those verses are always eliminated. We never have those verses in the lectionary of Judas's betrayal, and then the foreshadowing of P- Peter's denial. And that first and foremost is, uh, is really an important context for interpreting what Jesus is saying here about love and what love means and what love requires and what love looks like. And so that, that, that love is going to be uh, that love is going to be unpacked, if you will, further in the farewell discourse. And I, I would recommend to uh, preachers to, you know, to read through the farewell discourse <laughs> uh, and just uh, and get that language for what love is like in this gospel, uh, which is always an important aspect of of preaching biblically is that you can talk generally about love. Yes, but how? Wh- what is the specificity of the kind of love that Jesus is? Uh, it, Jesus is talking about here, and that's that's. And to be able to get that, you have to you have to locate it. As I said, as uh, sandwich, you know, is that sandwich between uh, that betrayal and denial, but then just the the larger context of the farewell discourse and and what what love looks like and and what uh, the kind of love that Jesus is asking of his disciples um, in, the, in the wake of his departure. My first comment, I have others, as you probably <laughs> imagine, but I'll stop there. Oh, really? I'm glad- well, John? <laughs> Go ahead, Matt. Well, I was, was going to say, I'm glad you started there, because that's where my questions reside as I was reading over this and trying to figure out, because this is going to come back in two weeks as well, this talk of glorifying and love as well. What is it about, let me back up, in maybe in John's theological imagination, what is it about love that connects it to things like resurrection or to Jesus' departure or his glorification, which is more than just resurrection, we know. But I mean, it raises question, what does it mean to say the son of man has been glorified and God has been glorified in him? I think a lot of us think that glorify means amplify it. It becomes loud or noticeable or something like that. But I think it's more than that in John. And and we all know that there's a love ethic in Christianity, but 
as I was reading this and preparing again, I think I'm not sure I would be able to give a polished explanation for what is it about the resurrection that should motivate us to love or that should make us um, better equipped to love or that should make us recognize the father's love for the son to use John's language. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean there? That we take resurrection as a display of power or a confident sign of hope for the future, but we kind of root love usually in how nice Jesus is to people. Right. Yeah. So can we talk a bit about that? Like, why should we be talking yeah. about love during Easter of all times? And well, in light of John's talk about glory and intimacy. Yeah, well, I think, well, first of all, I think that point is, is important because one of the other things that you want to do with this passage is say, okay, how does this, how does this love commandment sound different on Monday, Thursday, and then different in Easter in, in during the resurrection. And, and so how, so your question, then that's important. That was one thing that I wanted to point out is how, how does it sound different in the resurrection? And I think here, what love is, uh, I mean, for the glorification is, is really uh, the, the way in which Jesus is, uh, is this place of the visible presence of God. And so to glorify, to glorify God and to be glorified that, that the son of man has been glorified and God has been glorified in him is this um, synergistic reality of, of the way in which what that communicates is the presence of God among us. And so, and then that's really what the disciples are going to be. That's the kind of love that they're going to be asked to take on is how is it that how is it that that love becomes an ongoing visible presence of God in the world uh, for the sake of John three sixteen and it's a kind of love that uh, that that points to that presence and points to that visibility uh, and makes possible the presence of God uh, the presence of God's love uh, even when the fullness of that love is reached with the ascension. So did that make any sense at all? I mean. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. And I uh, also appreciate the, the question, uh, Matt, um, in, in two ways for me, uh, one, uh, and, and I think this weaves together with, with both the question and what you've said in both of your uh, comments, Caroline. And, and that is one, the context of Monday Thursday, where uh, we're talking about this moment of betrayal and and the weight of what comes next, uh, this focus on God after what was supposed to be a nice dinner among folks that we knew, you know, at this, what we know with hindsight is uh, at, at the, the end that they don't fully comprehend, but not to get ahead of that so that we can really feel the betrayal, so that we can really feel the weight of that moment. But now post-resurrection, um, the glory is not uh, what we think of in glory, which is you know, um, who won the, in, uh, the NCAA playoffs or you know, who won the Grammy or who got the Oscar. It, it's not that celebrity glorification, but it's the capacity after being completely um, um, a facing death of, of, of being betrayed, of, of complete loss, of absolute devastation, of the complete removal of control. And the resurrection demonstrates that our hope is in a God who overcomes that. And so I can love the one who betrayed me. I can love my enemies. I can demonstrate this embodiment of divine love because I'm not doing it in my own. I'm doing it filled with the presence of God that filled Jesus, which makes me, us, capable of being Christ-like Christian. And so I think the resurrection is the very demonstration that I've often said, if God can raise Jesus from the dead, 
then God can handle my love life or lack thereof, which for me is pretty, you know, devastating. But humor aside, when you face death and disease and destruction, you need something greater than just the idea of love. And I think the resurrection demonstrates, I can put my hope in this God, because if God can handle this, then maybe God can handle all of my this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think too, another, uh, another way to think about this is it really to go back to the beginning of this chapter, 13.1. Uh, and where Jesus says he loved them to the end. Now that the hour has come, he loved them to the end. And of course, that word there is telos, uh, and he loved them to completion, or he loved them to this, you know, this uh, this intended goal. And it's the same word that that is Jesus' last word in John. It is finished. And so that loving them until the end too is. Uh, I, the, the, the thing about the resurrection is that in John, that it's not, it's not the final end. It is, it is. And this, this gets, I've talked about this with pastors and it's like, you know, it, your head starts spinning with John because there's, we want to have a kind of uh, linear chronology of God's activity, of Jesus' activity. And, and so you have the incarnation and, and Jesus' ministry, and then the crucifixion and the resurrection and the ascension. And that, that linearity doesn't work for John. Uh, it doesn't, it, the, the, somehow, some way, John wants us to imagine that to love to the end, uh, to, love, uh, to love to that completion or what that love looks like demonstrated in Jesus, uh, demonstrated in Jesus uh, as God loving the world, and then in us encompasses this entirety of of what of of this love of becoming human, of dying, of rising, and then of course that reunification or that uh, that affirmation of that relationship once again. Once again, and so it's. Uh, yeah, it's it's a love that's caught up too in that kind of uh, that kind of Christology or theology uh, that that John is trying to work out, I think, as well. I, I you think Matt, that was a oh sorry, go ahead, Joy. No, I was gonna say I appreciate that uh, that interjection that disrupts the linear uh, focus because um, that that's exactly what's happening is that interjected into every moment in time of loss, of human failure, of, of, uh, of is this disruption of God in Jesus setting the world right again? And, and your, your description there actually, I, I think it's just brilliant uh, in a way of reminding us that this isn't an A, B, C, D. This is a because I know where Z is taking us, I will love you to the very end. Because I have this promise, wherever I find myself in this timeline, I can, I can live into that hope. And that keeps me going. I, oh, I, I love that. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, one more thing. Uh, <laughs> And then we probably should go on and then we'll let Matt, you know, expound on acts and it'll be just brilliant and fabulous. Uh, but the other thing is, is when we take seriously this context, going back to how I, I began the podcast, it's to recognize that uh, this commandment to love of loving one another, uh, how much they need to hear those words when they have just seen one of their own or witnessed one of their own walk out the door uh, and betraying and walking away from that relationship with Jesus and therefore walking away from a relationship, the relationship that they had with Judas. And so, so to think about this love commandment as not, you know, this sort of um, general okay, love one another, but it's a love that's speaking into this moment of troubled hearts and uh, as you were talking, Joy, and betrayal and, and, 
And when you go back and read that part of the uh, the passage of imagining the disciples listening to Jesus' words and looking at each other and saying, who is it? Who's going to be the one? Uh, and, and it's a love that is meant then to sustain them uh, to it, that the love that they share with each other is the love that's going to sustain them in Jesus' absence. And so it's to think of it as a, as, as a way of, of feeling that love of Jesus and that love of God, even when Jesus is not present, that that's what Jesus is asking us of us. And it's possible to feel that love and experience that love with one another that is meant to be uh, an expression of that relationship with Jesus. So, and they are going to need a lot of sustaining because this is at the beginning of the farewell discourse, and exactly. and we know what and we know what comes next. So. And the power of hindsight, sorry, Matt. The power of hindsight, or the power of a story, is that as the preacher is preparing to convey this, because we know that this is a hindsight reading, um, we know the end, and we know that this portion is familiar to those who have been a part of our community and congregation for years. That we can linger in setting this up, so that in the telling. Folks actually don't just get told there was a betrayal and Jesus loved anyway. That, that, that isn't powerful. That's, that's what makes it impossible. But to actually tell it with that lingering where we realize that pain, that loss, that confusion of the moment. And because we're getting this story in hindsight, we can linger there so that when that moment comes where Jesus says, but I'm going to talk about the love of God anyway, and so are you. It, it really is a disruption to the moment. And, and that is what makes the story and the stories come alive. Okay, Matt, I'm done. You go. Acts. Uh, not much. I, oh, you want to go to Acts? Oh, no. Did you have No, to you get to speak. You answered this question, Matt, and then Joy and I were like, oh, you yeah. Yeah, I mean, no, you, just, you know, I, I just I have a hard time when I go to John looking for explanations. Um, but in this case, I think what John's doing, especially during the Easter season and given the context of what Jesus is talking about is 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 talking about what's the ethic of Easter. And so many churches would rather talk about Easter as a time for convincing or as a time for believing or kind of mustering up belief in the resurrection. And it would be good also to talk about that a robust theology of resurrection has an ethic. And that ethic is one that the church actually is pretty bad at in terms of loving one another and, and in, in, in so doing, uh, convincing the world that uh, we are Jesus disciples. So mm -hmm. In a time when the church has lost so much moral credibility in society, it would be a good place to linger in that Easter ethic, perhaps. Which is a good segue to Matt, uh, to Acts, actually. Uh, when you think about uh, it was the commentary, the last paragraph of the commentary, how Israel and gentle, male and female, rich and poor, are to serve and share the table together. Uh, and sort of that that mutuality um, there that is present in that text is um, these identifiers of I really like that Matt of an ethic of the resurrection uh, is part of what we get in this story from Acts as well. Yeah, and for Acts it's hospitality that salvation, conversion, and Acts in Luke too almost always ends up in some kind of expression of belonging into a group into a new group. And that's the that's the uh, that's the scandal of what Peter does in chapter ten, and that he stays in Cornelius's house a few extra days, and in so doing, forms these kinds of bonds that 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 scandalize the his friends back in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With that focus, uh, and I thought about this uh, as we were preparing for this podcast. I think if I were preaching, I would turn to this Acts text, because as you began, Matt, what it does is it demonstrates this um, resurrection ethic of what love looks like and, and, as practice hospitality. Um, it's, 
uh, the opportunity to tell the un unfolding story um, that is emblematic of God of who um, God's work in humanity looks like or what God's work in humanity looks like. It's a setup for the community to come, uh, as is described in the last paragraph uh, that, that you pointed uh, of the commentary, Caroline. It's like all of it comes together here because it is that turn from the people just like us to extending this love of God made known in Jesus that is a love for all the world. Yeah, and, and this is where I think Acts is, is different from John in that I understand it <laughs> for one thing, but also it's this idea of the, of the power of God is the thing that, uh, or maybe I should say the initiative of God is what declares these things. And so the idea that this is interpreted as not a good idea on the church's behalf, but as an act of God that the church is now following behind and living into is important. Now, if you want to know the theme of post-Easter existence in the book of Acts, it's that line, who was I that I could hinder God? It's this idea of God has, God has shown what, that these barriers are now broken down, these, these walls that we thought were, were permanent. Uh, God has destroyed those. Your job now is simply to respond to that. Acts is, is a lot less interested in explaining how this all happens through the cross, but Acts will insist over and over again that through cross, resurrection, ascension, and the gift of the spirit, uh, God has, has, has made this new hospitality, this new kind of belonging actually possible. Yeah. And I think that's why, I think that's why I was drawn to, to, to say, if I were preaching, I'd preach the Acts text. Um, just as a reminder that the gospels were written after. And, and so we've got these events that have happened and then the stories are a reflection to say, oh, this is how we got there. So this lived experience that is recorded in the Acts, uh, literally the Acts of the apostles, um, this lived experience is because of what was understood about God because Jesus is raised from the dead. And so I, it makes sense, Matt, that these acts are much more understandable than the reflection on what's the story behind the story of these events. I understand the Psalm. We got another easy Psalm in Rolf's absence, which is nice that. That's right. It appears to be about praise. Well, and if you are, uh, if you are doing the, the, well, either the John text or the Acts text, I mean, that glorifying, the glorifying of God, but uh, particularly the Acts text you know, uh, that, uh, and they praised God, then God has given even to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life, uh, that how that, that praise then is articulated in the Psalm. And so, um, you know, the, the way in which you can make that connection, I think, uh, but I would use it liturgically. I wouldn't preach on, which I always well, because I'd be because I'd be preaching on Acts. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, are we okay to move to Revelation? And I'll just stay where I am to say, I'll preach on. I would preach on Revelations later because this week. I I'd be preaching on Acts, um, but uh, I I love this. This is one of my favorite uh, portions to begin to preach from Revelation. Is to begin with this this verse, uh, and and so in preparation for preaching um, from um, later uh, uh, in in the weeks to come, um, this recognition that what we have here is not what we see now, that there is a new heaven, there's a new earth, that God's promise is coming here. It's not pie in the sky when I die, I've said that before, but that it's it's coming here. And, and when that happens, what we will see is, is, is all good. Uh, it's praiseworthy, uh, if I use the, those words. And um, what, what does that look like? It looks like the tears from betrayal are wiped from our eyes, um, that the uh, mourning of death has been turned into rejoicing, that the 
uh, brokenness of disease uh, has been healed, um, that hungers and thirst have been filled. Um, this is the abundant life. This is the promise. But I would pay attention to all of this in order to preach it later. I just, th these words here are so important as the setup for what comes later. That's yeah. all. Well, and it, I think the, the promise here uh, and it is so extraordinary, especially how Revelation gets, uh, as we know, caught up in all kinds of, uh, all kinds of eschatologies or, uh, and even apoc uh, apocalyptic kinds of uh, dystopian realities. Uh, and, 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 you know, uh, part of this sort of hybrid thing of what's going to happen at the end of the world and the end of times. And so, so much of revelation ends up, pre preaching revelation ends up being a corrective of that. But one of the places that I always go when I talk about revelation and teach on revelation is this, this moment in verse three, see the home of God is among mortals and, uh, and he will dwell with them. And that dwell is, uh, is skenao. It's that tenting and tabernacling that we see in John 1 14. And so that, you know, that salvation <laughs> Or the end of the world, or whatever, uh, is not about uh, is not about the time or the battle or anything like that. But the promise is God's presence, uh, and that God makes God's home with us. That God uh, that God dwells with us, tents with us, tabernacles with us, and uh, and there's the promise of again, sort of upending, you know, thinking about resurrection, of resurrection is not this future. Yes, it's a future promise, but helping people recognize that resurrection is the promise of God's presence, even, even in the reality of death. Uh, and so how can we then speak and talk about resurrection through that language here that we get in Revelation?